I have chosen him that he can ma- may command his offspring after him that by doing righteousness and justice I may bring to Abram what I have promised him. What a great morning this is. A great morning to worship the Lord together. We've already had some great singing about fathers, the faith of our fathers. Fathers who have led us in the faith, who have taught us, who have grown us, spiritual fathers even. Very early, 2,000 years ago, Jesus said something that was significant too. In Mark chapter 10, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus actually tells the disciples. In the context where people are coming to Jesus, and Jesus has to tell them something important about the commitment of disciples. In Mark chapter 10, Truly I say to you, verse 29 and 30, Truly, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time both houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Don't know why they didn't come up there just now, but it works now. Okay. We're blessed. We're so blessed because we have fathers. Fathers who care for us. Fathers who have exemplified their faith for us. Fathers that have raised us to follow after the Lord. We're in a nation where fathers are becoming increasingly less common. There's not fathers in the homes as much anymore. America has this issue where fathers are becoming less and less common. And in a nation like this, some of you may be feeling this isn't such a joyous day for you. You don't have a godly father. And that's why this is such a blessing. That even for some of you who don't feel the joy of this day, Knowing that you don't have a Christian father in the home. You, don't, you didn't have maybe that father at all in the home. And that hurts. But we are so blessed that in Christ, we have spiritual fathers. That we gain this back. People who care for us. People who mentor us. People who will guide us. That's exactly what Jesus is getting at here. We've lost this in some sense. But we've been gained back all the more spiritually. And we are so blessed today. To be able to have spiritual fathers, physical fathers, fathers in Christ who are leading us to him. You know, Paul has actually made a spiritual father to Timothy and Titus. and the Thessalonian church, Abraham is considered a father of those who walk in his faith. And so for some time today, I want to consider the example of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 18 verse 19, we just noticed that he's actually chosen specifically by God that by commanding his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. God chose Abraham. God chose Abraham to be a father. And so I want to take some time today, this morning, to consider the example of Abraham as a father, a father in the faith, a father who leads us closer to God, a father who would lead his children closer to God. And so there's two very important lessons we can consider from the life of Abraham. And so first with you this morning, I want to consider Abraham's legacy of faith. This idea of legacy is something Abraham's handed down. He had this faith, he's handed it down to his children and the children after him, even down to until now. And so I want to consider with you the fact that Abraham began this life of faith by leaving the familiar. He began this life of faith by leaving the familiar. Look at me with Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. God told him, you're going to need to go to a land that you've never been before. You're going to need to leave your father's house, go to an entirely new place, and you're going to have to trust me in this, that I'm going to bring to you these great promises to multiply your offspring abundantly, to give you this great land, to bless your name, and to bless everyone, all nations of the earth, through you. 
that's going to take a lot of faith. He's leaving everything he knows. He's leaving his upbringing. He's leaving his father. He's leaving everything because God has made a promise to him. And we see that that is exactly the thing he does. Abraham went just as the Lord had told him. You know, it's hard. It's hard to leave everything you know. But Abraham does exactly that. But not only that, but Abraham is an example in that he grew in exemplifying God's value system. What in the world do I mean by that? There's a passage in Genesis chapter 14 where there's been this showdown between these different kings. There's been a group of four kings against a group of five kings. They've had a war. The group of five kings actually loses to these four more powerful kings. And Abraham takes his own men and goes and saves all these people, brings back um, the people, brings back the possessions, brings back the livestock. And here's what Abraham says to the very king who says, you can have things. You can have some of the Abraham deserves a cut here. He has a right to something here. He's done this great act and saved these people, saved their possessions. He has a right to take some of this worldly treasure. But here's what Abraham says. Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hands to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abram which I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who are with me. Let Aner and Eskel and Mamer take their share. These three other men who would come to him, Aner, Eskel, and Mamer, they'd come to him. Abraham had a right to worldly profit. He could have taken whatever he wanted. He had taken his own men, risked their, his own men's lives to save these people, to save their possessions who had been lost. But he says, I've lifted my hands to God. I will take nothing. His faith to God overcame his desire for worldly treasure. He valued the things of God more than he valued. And immediately after, God would promise him in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 through 6, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abraham, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him. As righteousness. Abraham's given up this opportunity for much worldly profit. He could have taken whatever he wanted, but he trusted in God. And God assures him that for this, his reward shall be very great. Up until this point, Abraham still doesn't see it paying off. He's been told he's going to be given a great land, he's been told he's going to be, his offspring is going to be multiplied. Abraham's not seeing this yet, but he has faith that God will give him just as he has promised, and he believed the Lord God, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. We're so blessed. We're so blessed to have fathers here who do this exact same thing, who exemplify God's value system, who believe in God's promises, believe in God's promises of a reward, just as Abraham did, who put their faith in what they cannot see. There's a lot of things that we're not sure is what's coming, A lot of things we can be uncertain about in this world. But we're so blessed to have good men here in this congregation that I've seen who are valuing spiritual things far above any business and success or worldly success that the world might define, who value the things of God. What a blessing. Isn't that a blessing, congregation? Isn't that a blessing to have fathers like that? It's such a blessing. But Abraham's faith went farther even than that. His faith would extend to even the most unpleasant of things. His faith would extend to even the most unpleasant of things. In Genesis chapter 17, God is going to make a covenant, a binding agreement, terms and agreements with Abraham. And this covenant is based on a ritual called circumcision, something I'm sure we're familiar with. But God's going to make a covenant with him. He renames him here to call him Abraham instead of Abram as he had been called before, for made exalted father the meaning of Abram, to father of a multitude. 
He still hasn't been made a father of a multitude. God is assuring him here that he's making him into this. This, this. Perhaps this promise would have even seemed laughable. You haven't shown me, I haven't hardly any descendants. I only have one son and it's by an Egyptian handmaid. And he's only 13 years old. And you've assured me that I'm going to be made the father of a multitude of nations. What a great promise. But we find that even in all of this, Abraham does exactly what God says to him. In Genesis chapter 17, in the midst of this covenant, Genesis chapter 17, we find that after God leaves, in Genesis chapter 17, verses 23 through 27, if you're reading with your Bibles, then Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all those born in the house are bought with money, every male among the men of Abram's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his portion. Ishmael's son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in his flesh. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in the house, were bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Abraham took every single one of them, including himself and his son, his 13-year-old son, his 99-year-old self. And he did just as the Lord commanded him. This wouldn't have been a pleasant thing to take care of. He may have only done this partially. You may have expected that because maybe you wouldn't have wanted to fully fulfill what God had said. But he did exactly. He put his faith in God. He did what God said. Faith would extend even to the extreme. We've seen here that he does something quite unpleasant. But faith here would extend even farther than that for Abraham. Even farther. In Genesis chapter 22... We're going to find a story in which he takes his only son. He's asked to take his son that he's been waiting for. This son of promise that God has promised to him that he's going to give to him. And he finally gets it in the previous chapter here in Genesis chapter 21. But in Genesis chapter 22, God's going to ask the unthinkable. I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. I have one of the verses up and we'll we'll come back to that in a minute. But I want you to read with me Genesis chapter 22 and notice verses 1 through 6. After these things, God tested Abraham. God wants to know whether Abraham really has faith. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Take your son, he said, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I command you, which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkeys, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering. And arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there, worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they were both them together. Drop down to verse 9. Notice verses 9 through 12. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Abraham wasn't going to stop. He was going to fulfill every step here to do exactly as God had told him. He rose early in the morning to go and do it. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And notice verse 12, we've got it on the screen here. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your only son, from me. If you needed any better test of faith from Abraham, I don't know what it would have been. This is the promise God had made to him that he's going to make his offspring abundant. And he finally did that by giving him this son. And God asked him to sacrifice him. And surprisingly, Abraham has no qualms about doing this. He goes right away. He rises early in the morning. He takes every step to bring leading up to this until he's raising his hand to slaughter his son before the angel stops him and tells him, now I know, now I know that you fear God. We're blessed here. 
to have fathers like this, fathers like Abraham, fathers who will go even to the extreme to do things that would have been unthinkable. If you want a more clear demonstration of your faith to, to be made to your sons, try slaughtering them and tell them because God, God told them to do. That would have been a pretty clear demonstration to Isaac that he had faith in God, that this was more important than anything else. They had absolute faith in God that would overcome any obstacle. And so we're seeing Abraham's great faith here. Abraham's amazing faith. But he wasn't perfect. Abraham was far from perfect. Abraham did not do everything correctly. At times, his fear overcame his faith. In these two stories here in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 20, in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 20, he lies. He lies about his wife Sarah and calls her his sister. And what, why does he do this? Why does he choose to do this? He is afraid. He's gone to Egypt in Genesis chapter 12. He's gone to um, Abimelech, king of Gerar, in Genesis chapter 20. And he is afraid that he will be killed. And so, out of fear, he chooses to lie and compromise his faith in God. At times, his self-reliance overcame his faith. In Genesis chapter 16, he actually had his son Ishmael. God has promised him a son. And he chooses to take things into his own hands and try to figure this out himself. And his self-reliance overcame his faith. And so a man like this, with such great faith, but we understand he wasn't perfect. We have fathers like this too. Fathers who've done so many amazing things in the faith. Who've had such great faith in God to do exactly as God had told them. To do extreme things, to do unpleasant things, to do as God had told them. Imperfect, but like Abraham, they are remembered for their faith. When you come to the New Testament, when you come to Hebrews chapter 11, we find that the thing mentioned about Abraham is not his failures, but his great faith in God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive it as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith Abraham, verse 17 through 19, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac his son, and he would receive the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. From which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham had such great faith. Faith that would drive him to do unbelievable things. And despite his deeds of failure, despite his shortcomings, he is a father, a good father, who is remembered for his faith in God. Faith that would lead him to believe more in an invisible city, heaven, Faith to believe in a resurrection. And we have fathers like this today who believe in that heavenly city, who believe in that resurrection that God has promised that he will raise his people from the dead. It's hard to see that. We don't see that with our eyes. We see people die and stay dead. We, see, we, don't, we haven't seen people enter heaven quite literally. But we have fathers here who believe in that mission, who believe in heaven, and who are striving all the more not only to put their focus on that, but to put their son's focus on that. And we're so blessed to have that in this congregation. But secondly, Abraham has been made our spiritual father. For people who don't have fathers, it's such a blessing that we have spiritual fathers like Abraham. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, he's having an argument with the Galatians here. And he asks them this, Does he who supplies the spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith. Just as Abraham believed the God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. He says that by, in the faith, we are sons of Abraham. In Romans chapter 4, in Romans chapter 4, 
Notice with me Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. Abraham believed God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Romans 4 verses 11 and 12. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. While still uncircumcised, the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. So that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in. In the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Now I know I said circumcised a lot. But actually the point in this passage is that Abraham has become our father. And we become, he's made our father when we walk in the footsteps of his faith. We have fathers like Abraham today. Faithful fathers, spiritual mentors, spiritual father figures who are leading in the faith are walking just as Abraham walked, and we see how they walk in the faith, and we see the way they act. We see them putting their trust in God, despite what the world would suggest. And we can be encouraged. We can follow their example that we can walk in the footsteps of their faith. And how blessed we are. How blessed we are to have fathers, spiritual and physical alike, who teach and pattern this example of valuing the promises of God. Faithfulness to God over comfort and convenience. Faith in God at all times. Such a blessing. You know, Abraham didn't know it at the time, but he would truly be a blessing to all people. And an inspiration to us, even now to today. And we have inspirations in this congregation. People who are leading the faith. And it's so great. It's so great that we have spiritual and physical fathers like this today. Thank God. For faithful fathers. Thank God for faithful fathers. My family's actually here today. So I'm thankful to have my father right over here. If you'd like to see them after worship services, they're right in there here in this middle pew right here. Just, just so you know. Thank God for faithful fathers. You know, Abraham demonstrates yet another important characteristic of godly fathers. He demonstrates his uh, characteristic of godly fathers in that he guided and protected his sons. That he, his guidance and protection. You know, it's difficult to detect more, if even a hint of selfishness towards his sons. He's pretty diligent to be unselfish, to lead his sons, to care for his sons, and specifically in his relationship with Lot, his nephew. He's become a father figure, figure to his nephew Lot. Now, I don't know if you know the background, but the background of this is his father has died. He's taken charge of Lot after the death of his father. His father's passed away. He's no longer with him. And in Genesis chapter 11, it says here, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran fathered Lot. But Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. But then we see when Abraham was called in Genesis chapter 12, so Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. You know, Abraham took Lot with him. His, his, he's now his uncle. But we would see just from this very simple step, this very first step, that as he took Lot with him, so too would he lead him, would he guide him, would he protect him and care for him. And so, first of all, I want to consider with you the fact that he sought peace between him and Lot. He sought peace between him and Lot. You know, no doubt, at times, fathers and sons have disagreements. No doubt, at times, fathers and sons have arguments, have places where they do not see eye to eye. But here we see an example in Abraham, where in the midst of Abraham and Lot have come to a land where the land is not big enough to support them. And they have to separate. But Abraham is determined that he is not going to allow this to create more strife between them. He is going to seek peace between him and Lot. Notice Genesis chapter 13. Abraham said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, I will go to the right. If you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, in the direction of Zor. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley 
and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Abraham seeks peace between him and his son. He could have very well demanded that he take the land. He was rich. But he lets Lot choose. He lets Lot choose. He knew probably that Lot would take the better land. Anyone in his right mind probably would. But he lets Lot choose anyway. In the following chapter, he was going to save him from danger. Lot's in a very tough situation. He's in a very dicey situation. It's actually back in Genesis chapter 14, as we had looked at earlier. I didn't neglect to mention on purpose that when all these people are captured, when this war happens with the kings, Lot's actually captured. Lot's one of those people living in that area who's captured. And in Genesis chapter 14, here's what happens. Then one who had escaped came and told Abraham the Hebrew that Lot has been captured who was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eskel and of Aner, these were allies of Abraham. When Abraham heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. We see there that he takes his own men. He takes his own men to save his kinsmen, Lot. He cares about him. Abraham could have sat here and think, well, he chose to live where he lived. He chose this land. Good riddance to him. He ought to deal with his own problems. Abraham could have done that. But he cared about his kinsmen, Lot. And he took his own men, risked their own lives so that he could save Lot. We already know there wasn't any self-interest involved. He didn't get anything out of this. Back in chapter 14, he didn't take any money. He didn't take any possessions. He just wanted to save his kinsman Lot. He just wanted to take care of him. He would intercede, even on his behalf. Here's a very complex situation in Genesis chapter 18. And if you wanted to read it on your own time, Genesis chapter 18, verses 22 through 33. Abraham intercedes on behalf of the city of Sodom. God is going to destroy these wicked people. God is going to utterly destroy them off the face of the earth. But Lot is living there. Abraham takes this time to intercede on behalf of Lot. He wants these people to be saved. He would even intercede on behalf of the city that even if there were ten righteous people, that God would spare them. He would ask that God would spare them if there are just ten righteous people. In the end, that doesn't happen. But in the midst of this, we find that even then, God shows his faithfulness to Abraham and saves Lot. And here's why. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which he had lived. God saved Lot because of Abraham. And we're so thankful I'm so thankful that we have godly fathers, fathers who make peace with their sons, fathers who seek this relationship with them, fathers who sacrifice their own well-being to take care of their sons, fathers who seek the spiritual welfare of their sons. We're going to see here in a minute with Isaac that that's exactly what he does. Fathers who care like that. We're so, that's such a blessing to have godly fathers like that. And we see here that that is exactly what he did. He cared for the spiritual welfare of his very own son, Isaac. He's demonstrated all his care for his kinsman, Lot, his nephew. He's been a father figure to him, but now he's going to demonstrate this to his own son. In Genesis chapter 24, Abraham's getting old. He's getting older and older. Notice notice what it says in Genesis chapter 24. Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to the land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? 
Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. You must not take my son back there. What, what, what's going on here? Abraham's getting old. He's getting towards the end of his life. He's winding down. And he takes this opportunity to care for his son Isaac. His, his, his wife has passed away. Isaac's mother, Sarah, has passed away. This is a rough situation. And it's, he wants to be sure that in the land where he lives, he lives among an immoral people, the Canaanites. He is determined that a son, a wife for Isaac, will not be taken from among them. He does not want this to be a hindrance to Isaac. He, neither does he want him to go back to the land from which he's come. He came from Ur or Haran. He does not want Isaac to go back there. He does not want him to be tempted to stay there. This is the land of promise. And so we see that he's caring for his son here. And in God's providence, God would do exactly as he had said because of Abram's faith. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. In a world where there's more degeneration, where iniquity is increasing, we're blessed to have godly fathers who care about our spiritual welfare, who protect us from the influences of the world, and who care for us or are quick to point them out and are aware of them and want to protect us from these evil influences. We have fathers, physical and spiritual fathers, who have sought our good, In a world of ungodly fathers, they've cared for our spiritual welfare and it's so thankful, so thankful to have these fathers. I want to take a minute and acknowledge something. Society is continuing to denigrate these great fathers we have, to downplay them, to get down on them for something that they're doing so well. We have fathers, good men here today, Men who are raising their children in the Lord, just as God has commanded. But society is getting down more and more, saying that fathers aren't needed. Fathers don't need to lead. Mothers can do the same thing. Fathers, we're blessed to have you. And if any of you are doubting that today, I think everyone will agree that we are blessed to have godly fathers. Fathers who care about the instruction of the Lord. Fathers who are leading their children putting their trust in God, leading in the faith, putting God's things before their own, before the world's values, sacrificing for them, watching out for their spiritual welfare. Do not let this hostile world, this permissive world, get down on you. Don't let that happen. You are doing the Lord's work. And we're blessed. We are blessed to have godly fathers like that. Fathers leading in the faith. Do not let the world get you down. Don't let them get you down. Thank God we have caring fathers. So with this question, with this concern that we have such good fathers, brethren, what can we do to show honor to our fathers? What must we do? Well, there's a few things. I want to acknowledge that fathers keep being fathers in the Lord. It's going to get hard. It gets discouraging. Don't put down the mantle. God chose you for this. A few weeks ago, we talked about God's great plan for unity in the church, for us to be united together, serving a common purpose. And we acknowledge that fathers are serving an important role in the kingdom by being fathers. Don't forget that. Keep serving in that role. But there's a few things we can do who have fathers to honor them, to honor those spiritual role models, those people who have mentored us, who have cared for us, who have nurtured us, and those physical fathers who have brought us up in the Lord. Be wise as they've taught you. In Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 1, Proverbs chapter 10 verse 1, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 20, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 24, the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Children, you want to honor your fathers? Those who aren't even children, you want to honor your fathers? 
Keep walking in wisdom. Keep walking in righteousness. Honor your fathers by being wise, by being righteous. Honor them in that today. There's no greater joy. No greater joy. Let me, let me get an idea of this. This is something a little bit untraditional. But if you agree with me, I'd like you to say amen. Fathers, there's nothing you'd like more than to know that your children are walking in the faith. Is that correct? Amen. That's what they want for you. They want to know that you're wise and righteous more than anything else, that you're following God. And so show your honor to them today. Show your honor to them this week. Show your honor to them this year. And be wise. Be righteous as they've taught you to be. But secondly, accept their discipline. It's not a pleasant thing. It never was meant to be. But understand this about discipline. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12. The Lord reproves him who he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. Chapter 13 and verse 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. These are some interesting images we don't often think about. But fathers love their kids so much that they discipline them. Again, the world gets down on that. But fathers are serving in the Lord by disciplining you. They're showing that they care for you. They're showing that they delight in you. Because they're diligent to discipline you. Even with the rod. If they didn't, they would actually not care for you as they ought to. But that since they care about you so much, they discipline you. You want to show honor for them today? Don't rebel against that. Don't rebel against their wisdom. Honor them for that. Thank them that they disciplined that they, you, that they led you in the Lord. Go back to your father and tell them how thankful you are, that they've guided you in that way, that they disciplined you so that you could be a child in the faith. Thirdly, though, remember their warnings. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 17, gives a very visceral sort of picture here. The eye that mocks the father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. You want a grotesque image? A bird picking out your eyeballs is pretty grotesque. That's, <laughs> that's how it compares, mocking and disobeying a father. Scorning, you know, um, disobeying them, mocking them. Don't do that. Honor your fathers today. Honor them by remembering their warnings. The words they have to give to you are for your good. They want to help you. They want to guide you. Honor them for that today. Don't, don't despise their discipline. Don't despise their instruction. For some of you, if you're feeling disconnected, fathers, children, maybe you have some spiritual mentor whom you've grown distant from. Maybe you have your literally physical father you've grown distant from. For one of the of the other reason. If you disconnected from that, make that right. It's enormously valuable. We're blessed to have such good fathers. We're blessed to have these relationships. If you need to, make those right. Thank God that we have these fathers. Fathers like Abraham. Wrapping this up, we have fathers like Abraham who are leaving a legacy of faith to follow, who are guiding and protecting their families. Children, people who have fathers, honor them. Honor them for their sacrifices for you, for guiding you, for prioritizing what's right, for being an example to you all these many years. And fathers, if you're getting discouraged, remember Abraham. Remember Abraham's example. It started with a simple faith. It started with a simple faith, and he certainly wasn't perfect. But he began with that, and he followed it through. He saw his faith through, and for that, he is still remembered thousands of years later. As a father of faith. You can be that too. Keep fathering. So that the generation to come will know the Lord. Don't give up. And brethren, honor your fathers. Go ahead and close your Bibles. Put your things away. Perhaps some of you today, this morning... Don't feel that you've been the father you ought to be. Perhaps some of you today don't feel that you've been the son you ought to be. We want to help you with that. Maybe you're struggling with some other sin, some other issue that you can't seem to find a way through. Well, if you've been prompted by this message in any way today, we want to help you today. If you want to commit your life back to God, if you want to make that right with him, or if you've never committed your life to God and want to commit to him today, I'll tell you that God has commanded us that we should repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, and that in doing so, we will receive the forgiveness of our sins. 
And so if you'd like to make that commitment today, if you'd like to come to God to make something right, if we can offer you any spiritual assistance in any of these ways, please come together as we stand and as we sing.